Welcome to the first episode of Why Sense. My name is Vasu and I'm chair of the Center for Nanoscience and Engineering at the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore. We are an interdisciplinary center and we have everybody ranging from physicists, physicists to chemists to biologists, electrical engineers, mechanical materials engineers, you name it, even aeronautical engineers working on a range of diverse problems at this department. We have Professor Akshay Nayak with us today and he works on MEMS or micro electro mechanical systems and NEMS or nano electro mechanical systems. Now, if you think that's serious and involved and deep, think again, because all Professor Akshay Nayak has been doing is he has been playing the guitar for the last 20 years or so and has been having fun. Well, to get a little more serious, his guitar strings are about a thousand to a million times thinner than the diameter of the string you would find on a regular guitar. But the concept remains the same. And he uses this concept in the form of mechanical resonators to study extremely delicate phenomena, such as, for instance, measuring the mass of a hydrogen atom or looking at quantum effects. So today, Professor Nayak will be telling us about tracking motion at the nanoscale. So over to you, Akshay. So as Vasu said, uh, I we work with uh, very small uh, string-like structures, right? These are vibrating structures. Um, and one of the questions uh, we want to answer here um, is why do we think, uh, or do I think, uh, these structures are interesting? Why do, what excites me about these structures? Um, the vibrating structures in themselves are interesting because um, the way I see it, everything is moving, right? Uh, even though you don't feel it, even though I don't feel it, uh, things are moving. Uh, you cool them down to zero Kelvin, they are still moving. Um, it's just a, a quantum motion, but they are still moving. Uh, they are also interesting because these mechanical structures, these small mechanical structures, you can use them to study a lot of things. Uh, they are quite versatile in terms of what they can sense. Uh, also, they can be used to study a lot of, um, you know, really exotic phenomena. One would be uh, looking for quantum effects, for example, right? We also talked about doing these measurements um, very precisely. You could ask how precise of a measurement can you do, right? And ultimately it will be limited by quantum mechanics, right? So we ask those kinds of questions, questions like what can we sense? How precise of a measurement can we do? Uh, what is the limitation? If there is a limitation, how do we overcome that? So that's why I think they are interesting. Um, so these things, most of you have uh, come across these vibrating structures all the time. But one is, you know, these string uh, instruments, right? Uh, you can basically uh, play a string and you hear a music, right? It's vibrating. You pluck something, you hear a music. Now, what you can do is, for example, change the tension or the length, right? You place your fingers on different frets, right? These are called frets, these lines. You place them, place your finger on different frets, you play them. And that the music produced is completely different. And I'll, I'll kind of try to show this, right? So if you can hear, Right. That's a string I'm playing. I can now change this string. Right. This, the, the frequency changes. So your ear is a sensor which is detecting the fact that I'm changing the tension. Right. We do very similar things, but at nanoscale. 
right? Much smaller than the strings that you uh, see here. There are also, these things are also very useful, these mechanical structures or this uh, motion of mechanical structures is very useful to do other kinds of things also, exotic things, like you must have heard of gravitational waves. And these are waves, uh, we've recently detected, started detecting these gravitational waves, which come from, uh, you know, uh, billions of years of light years away. Right? The black holes are colliding, because of that, there is a huge amount of gravitational waves that is pr produced. And you want to detect it. Now, how do you detect that? And it, it, I must say, this is kind of one of the really uh, fantastic uh, things that uh, we humans have done uh, in detecting these waves. Right? Um, so what they're doing is they have two arms, there is one mirror here that is free to move. Similarly, there is another mirror that's free to move here, far away, right? And they're sending lasers from this end to this, and also from here to this mirror, okay? And then when the gravitational wave comes, it kind of moves these mirrors uh, by about 10 raised to minus 20 meters. That's one part is 10 raised to 20 meters. Okay? So that's the kind of motion that we can detect, that we need to detect to be able to see these gravitational waves. Right? These black holes are colliding some billions of years, uh, uh, light years away, and that is producing a wave. And that wave, as when it comes to Earth, it moves these mirrors, this mirror and this mirror, by 10 raised to minus 20, minus 20 meters. And we are able to detect that. And that's, that's really amazing. Okay? I do not work on this thing, but I work on similar things on chip. A lot of people work on chip devices, but the mechanism is very similar. Uh, so yeah, we, so people make all kinds of devices at nanoscale also. These LIGOs, uh, this, to detect gravitational waves, these LIGOs are really kilometer long uh, systems. But you can also make very small devices. And people have made all kinds of devices, all kinds of different structures to use them for sensing, to study quantum mechanics, to uh, study nonlinear dynamics. And you can right here see different geometries, right? Here, for example, it's a, a diving board kind of cantilever. All right? This is only about 10 microns. This device is a, a graphene resonator. It's about a micron long, right? It's clamped at two ends. It's a beam kind of structure. This is a, a membrane structure. This entire thing is free to move, right? People use uh, people because they want to do precise measurements. Uh, they need to make sure, for example, when you pluck a string of your guitar, right? Uh, it rings for some time and then dies away. For the kinds of measurement that we do, we do not want that information, that the, the, the vibration to die away quickly. We want it to be sustained for a very long time so that we can do very precise measurement, right? You pluck it, it should ring, for example, maybe three minutes. That doesn't happen in guitar strings, right? You pluck it, it rings for a few seconds, then dies down. In our case, we want it to run for, you know, for a very long time so that we can do precise measurement. So people have come up with ways, different design geometries to figure out how to reduce the loss that happens in guitar strings, for example, right? How do you reduce that? How do you reduce that in our devices, okay? Uh, they've made extremely small, uh, uh, thin nanowires 
a few tens of nanometers wide. There is a question on how we can detect black hole waves. I think they are basically asking how you can detect gravitational waves. Ah, uh, okay. So the way to think about it is, and uh, my expertise is not there, but I will try to answer the best that I can. So the way to think about it is um, uh, when you know these uh, bodies, right? When these planetary bodies move, right? They are uh, changing the fabric. I mean, you can imagine all of these planet stars are in some uh, sitting in a fabric, right? Imagine uh, uh, you know a heavy ball on a thin sheet of uh, um, you know uh, sheet, right? When you place the ball, it bends, it curves that uh, the structure. So that's what is happening with the gravity. So when uh, these big bodies collide, right, that fabric is disturbed, right? And that wave propagates through the space, through the space time. And because these black holes were uh, billions of light years away, it has reached us now, okay? And we were able to detect it. Yeah. It's possible and it's quite likely that we are being bombarded with these waves all the time it's just that in the last five six years our the sensitivity level of our systems of the LIGO has improved that we can detect it okay the smaller events we are still probably not detect but the fact that the wave comes what it does is maybe i can if i go, go here the fact that this is uh, rotating and colliding produces a lot of energy and these gravitational waves come and they basically impinge on this mirror and this mirror. Okay. And when the wave passes, it produces an, a contraction in one direction and expansion in the other direction. So, for example, the distance between this mirror and this mirror decreases and this mirror and here increases. So, based on the time it takes, to travel this distance and this distance, you are able to tell that something has happened. And you might say, look, how do you know it's not an earthquake? That's a possibility. So that's why people have built multiple of these systems far away from each other. Right? So that if they detect these events in both of these LIGOs, then they know it's a, a, a you know, gravitational wave. Otherwise, it's some noise. I, I hope that uh, made that clear. So one of the questions that has come up and which I'm trying to interpret myself is what role do non-local elasticity theories play in this? Okay, I will not try to answer that because it's too far away from my field. Uh, I just uh, demonstrated uh, the Lego um uh, so ligo <laughs> ligo is something my son plays with uh, ligo because i wanted to show that the mechanical motion of the mirror um, that these ligos have is extremely important right that's the kind of measurements we are doing right so there is a, a, a motion that's happening and that is a very small amount of motion and we are trying to detect that. In LIGO, it's a really big system. We are trying to do uh, similar kind of things on chip, All right? So I wanted to bring out that analogy, uh, but I will not try to answer that question. It's not my uh, area of expertise. Okay, let's let's just start with what we are doing, right? We, we, we can do, right? Uh, what I was talking about is the kinds of devices uh, people make, right? When we talk about electromechanical systems or optomechanical systems, uh, we are making these on chip, right? And we use these um, for all kinds of things, from sensing uh, to studying, for example, nonlinear dynamics or to study quantum uh, effects, right? To see 
um, whether we can observe quantum effects in these mechanical structures. Right? You can easily imagine that, look, uh, a few atoms will show uh, quantum effects. But what if uh, people can show that quantum effects are, you know, you, know, you can see those even in these mechanical structures. Real, these are really big structures, right, which have kind of 10 raised to 10 kind of atoms. It's, these are not individual atoms. So you can do those kinds of things. So we are interested in using these for sensing, uh, using these to study uh, nonlinear dynamics, uh, how do these devices kind of, you know, talk to each other and so on. Okay. So, but I'll, I'll start with how um, we use this to do sensing. And by sensing, I'm specifically now going to talk about mass sensing. Okay, how do you detect, how do you use these strings to kind of detect changes in mass? Okay, so this is our guitar string. And the only thing we are doing is making it at a much smaller scale, right? This is the string that we are using, for example. And this is about 20 microns, right? One fifth of, say, average human hair. That's the length of this string. Okay? We can get, make it even smaller. And this is made of a material called silicon nitride, but we can make these out of graphene, 2D materials, if you've heard of it. Right? What is this? This is a single layer of carbon atom, just a single layer. Three angstroms, about three angstroms. Okay, the length is about a micron. And the amazing thing is, right, that this is a, a single layer of carbon atoms. Right, imagine the fact that you can see this is in itself a great thing, right? That's, that just boggles your mind that you can see a single sheet of carbon atoms. The fact that you can make devices out of this, that's even more amazing. Now imagine being able to kind of pluck that string, pluck this single sheet of carbon atom and being able to detect the motion. And that's what we do. That's what people can do now. All right. So how, in all these cases, in all these cases, there is a frequency at which these things vibrate, just like guitar strings, like you plucked it, they have a certain frequency. You pluck this, you kind of give it a kick, it has a certain frequency, it's called resonant frequency. Okay, so that frequency depends on the mass of the device. On the guitar string, it has a certain mass, and that determines the frequency. Other things also determine the frequency, but because we are talking about mass, sensing masses, I just show this. Frequency depends on the mass. Right? If I take the guitar, one of these guitar strings, and kind of put some material on it, a small amount of material, you know, a, a little bit, the frequency changes. And if your ear is tuned to be able to detect very small changes in frequency, you will say, look, something has happened. Maybe the mass has changed. Right? You do exactly the same thing at smaller scale, but you do not use your ear to do the detection. You use all kinds of electronic circuitry. Okay? And so the question is, why do you want to go to smaller scale? Or why can't you just do this at this scale? So and the reason actually, is you... Yes. I actually, there's a question. Yeah. And I'm guessing uh, the question... Uh, says how do you design these microstructures and as you go nano doesn't small scale effect come into play i'm guessing the importers do the design rules that are there in the regular world do they change mm -hmm. and how do you design all right okay um, so the design uh, uh, so for example this right let's say how do you design this but um, what you do is uh, you start with a wafer, for example, right? And uh, exactly where you want the, the string to be, you cover it with certain material, okay? 
so that it protects everything underneath it. So we will put some material right here so that it protects it. And then what you do is you use some ions to kind of bombard, okay? So everywhere the material is protected, nothing happens. Everywhere else the material is removed. Okay, so that's a process called etching. So you do that. And then what you do is you use additional process to remove material underneath this beam that you have, underneath this material that you have. Okay, so that's that's the process that people use. And it's quite, uh, it's called micro-machining. You can use uh, uh, different kinds of uh, materials, different kind of processes to make extremely complex uh, uh, systems, mechanical systems, um, and you have probably used some of these um, in your daily life. For example, uh, when you take your cell phone, right, uh, you rotate the cell phone, the picture rotates, right? That's because of something called MEMS. Right, microelectromechanical systems. Those are inside your phone. They can detect the fact that you have rotated your phone. Okay, and that's why the picture also rotates. Okay, so these things can be done. That's the first question, the uh, um, answer to the first question. The second question, I think what, what uh, uh, they're asking is, when you make things smaller, do things change? Yes, a lot of things change. This thing, uh, the fact that frequency depends on mass, that holds true. But there are lots of things that do change. Right? For example, in this case, you can easily detect uh, you know, uh, frequency. I mean, you hear it. But when you make devices smaller, the frequency goes up and you will not be able to hear it. You will have to come up with ways to detect this frequency, to detect this motion in different ways. And you, as you make devices smaller and smaller, the way you do the detection becomes different. So there are lots of changes that happen as you make things smaller, but there are certain things that uh, you know, uh, the principle remains the same. Okay, I hope that answered the question. I don't have, okay. He says, I was interested in prefabrication design, software features and design principles, etc. Okay, that's probably a, a, a lecture in itself. Uh, maybe we can take it up with uh, people like uh, uh, Saurabh and uh, Prasanjit, which would probably come up uh, sometime soon. Okay, so there is a fabrication related question from Aniruddha Guha and he asks, how do you remove the material underneath the strings? Right, um, okay. Um, again, uh, lots of different ways. Uh, so certain chemicals uh, attack only certain materials, okay? So what you can do is the structural material, the material which the beam or the string is going to be made of, you can choose such that that is resistant to this chemical, okay? And underneath that structural material, you can choose a material which can be removed. For example, in this case, right? Underneath, underneath the graphene, there was oxide, okay? Before we made this device, underneath the graphene, there was oxide. So what we did was took this structure that we made. This is the metal. These are the two metals. We dipped it in something called uh, HF. Okay. And that HF attacks the oxide and removes it. Okay. So now the graphene remains, but if all the material underneath, which was oxide, silicon oxide, that got removed. So now you have a suspended structure. Okay, so that's just one way. There are different ways, different uh, chemistries that you can use to do these things. Um, um, in this particular case, we used a wet chemistry to remove the material underneath. Um, I think in this particular case, we used uh, um, uh, dry reactive ion etching to remove the material underneath. Okay, so there are different ways of doing these things. 
Okay. 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 So, so now why do you want to go to smaller scale? The reason you want to go to this a smaller scale is um, what we are typically interested in is measuring small and small masses, smaller and smaller masses. Okay. So what's the small mass? What's the mass that we can detect? Okay. So the mass that we can detect using these strings is given by this equation. Okay. So this is the mass that you can detect. That depends on the mass of the string itself. In this particular case, guitar string. In this particular case, the device that we made. What's the mass of the device? Okay. And then there is fluctuations in the frequency that happen. It also depends on that. Okay. And then this is the relative fluctuation. For example, if when you pluck the string, right, there is it's not a precise frequency. There is some fluctuation in frequency that's happening. Okay, that's ultimately going to determine what's the minimum uh, mass you can detect. Okay, so clearly you see that the uh, uh, the resolution, as we call it, right, the minimum mass that you can detect using these devices depend on the mass of the device itself. Assuming all of this remains constant, so you make smaller device, you get better mass resolution. Okay. And we've taken this, we've done this, people have done this over the years. And what you can see is the mass resolution improves as you make devices smaller and smaller. Okay, and it improves dramatically. For example, when you go from something called MEMS, which is microelectromechanical systems, to nanoelectromechanical systems. So micron sized devices to nano sized devices. Now well, that's a factor of thousand in dimension okay so you reduce the dimension by a factor of thousand your resolution the minimum mass that you can detect the delta m that improves by nine orders of magnitude you go from 10 raised to minus 15 grams to 10 raised to minus 24 grams right you reduce the size by three orders of magnitude a factor of thousand you reduce the mass resolution, you improve the mass resolution by a factor of 10 raised to 9. So that's a huge improvement. And just to give you a feel, 10 raised to minus 24 grams is a single hydrogen atom, roughly. Right? So we can now make devices, guitar strings, which are so small and so sensitive that in principle we should be able to detect individual hydrogen individual hydrogen atoms landing on them okay so that's the precision that we've reached okay and uh, you can use this for other things also i mean this is the, the previous slide was just an example uh, about mass sensing okay but you can imagine doing this sensing of anything sensing anything that changes the frequency of your device or the property of your device okay for example in this particular case before i move forward if you have questions on the previous slide i can answer those mm, there's none currently so i think you can go okay. on fine so <clears throat> uh in this particular case we have a chip and this is a, a few millimeters uh, uh, wide, a few millimeters long, okay? And uh, if I flip it, uh, this is what you see, okay? And right here is this thing. This is the square part that you see there, okay? So what we've done is we've removed, etched away as we call it, we removed the material underneath this, okay? And uh, this thickness, the thickness of this a chip is about, I think, 300 microns or something. Okay. So what we removed about 200 microns of material from the backside and made a hole. Okay. And that's right here. This is the portion where we removed the material. Okay. On the front side, on the top side, we have a device similar to the graphene device that I showed you. Okay. And if you see closely, Right here, right, you see a raised area. And that's where the student who works with me, he's, what he's done is taken a, a, a tweezer 
and he's pushing it up. Okay, and that's this raised area. Okay, so what you can what can you do with this? Now, just a cartoon demonstration. So we have a device just like graphene right here. Okay, this is the chip. That's this chip. Okay, so this is our device. This is a zoomed in image of this. Okay, so what you can do is now kind of push just like the student is doing. You can push from the back side, and this push could be pressure, right? You push from the back side because you're pushing now the entire chip is kind of slightly bent. Okay, now if you bent it, the tension in the device, right? The tension in the device, how much is it stretched? That changes. So the frequency changes. So now you can detect pressure changes. Right? Initially it was slacked like this. Now because you are bending it, the, there's tension. The frequency of this device is changing. And with, with, with the, this very simple kind of setup, we can detect one part in 10 raised to 7 changes in strain. All right? So for example, you can detect a, 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 a displacement or stretching of, say, uh, uh, less than a nanometer over 10 microns of device. Okay, extremely precise measurement, extremely precise changes in strain. You can use these to detect pressures. Right? If you make small changes in pressure, the frequency changes, you can do those detections. Okay, so not just mass, not just pressure, anything, any property, any uh, property that produces a change in frequency or uh, produces a displacement in these devices, you can do the detection. The only question is how do you measure this and how pre precisely can you measure it, okay? Going back to our mass measurement. <clears throat> um, so what we do is, again, just to demonstrate how, we, how this is done is you have a cantilever or a beam, right? You can use anything. The molecules come and stick to it. Okay, molecules come and stick onto these devices. And because they have deposited, the frequency shifts. Okay? And as I said, the frequency shift that you see is going to be determined by the amount of mass that you added on to the cantilever. Okay, I've told you, people have done extremely precise measurements. They have made extremely small devices and done precise measurements with these devices. I'll just give you two examples, okay? One is that I uh, did long time ago. Uh, what you see is frequency shift, right? This is frequency shift and this is time. Right? What you're looking at is these step-like features. The frequency is changing suddenly, right? You see it jump. Each of those jumps is because one protein molecule, just one, one protein molecule has come and landed on this cantilever or a device. That's what has happened, okay? This is for one particular protein. This is for a different protein. Okay, so you can detect proteins, not just bunch of proteins, one protein at a time. Okay, here's another, this is a more, uh, more recent one. What they've done is, they've done similar measurements. They have a cantilever uh, or a beam. What they do is spray on top of them virus capsules. Okay, the virus all the COVID thing, you probably know, virus consists of two things, two main things. One is something called capsid, which is the enclosure. And inside that enclosure, there is either DNA or RNA. Okay, so in this particular case, what they do is they spray these things onto the cantilever and they are able to identify whether the capsid has DNA in it or doesn't have DNA in it, right? In this particular case, it's empty. So the mass is about 30 megadalton, 
okay, thirty equivalent to thirty million uh, hydrogen uh, atom. If it is filled with DNA, then it has about hundred megadal. So they are able to identify this. So you can use these systems to do very precise measurements of biological entities, mass measurements of biological entities. Okay. So Akshay, there's a question. Yeah. On how does electrostatics impact uh, these measurements? What do you? What does if if they could clarify what exactly they mean? That would be helpful. I'm guessing what they mean is if you have random or stray charges that come, set, and so on, uh, would those impact these measurements? Absolutely, uh, that is likely to uh, uh, impact um, the measurement. For example, um, let's just look at this, right? So, let's say a particle comes which has certain amount of charge on it. Okay. Uh, now the charge is now sitting here and that means the potential difference between this device and the back gate as we use it will change a little bit okay now because the potential difference has changed that might change the frequency a little bit and the question is is that important at this point or not in most of the measurements that we've done till now that's not important that's not the main source of noise Okay, but as you keep making more and more precise measurements, as you make devices much more sensitive, um, any charge, additional charge, any stray, any stray uh, charges that come, any fluctuations in temperature will become important. In fact, uh, even in the measurements that we do, we have to make sure that the chamber in which the device is, is in ultra high vacuum. Otherwise, what happens is the stray gas molecules can come and sit on the cantilever and that changes the mass of the cantilever, right? So that's a noise that we don't want, right? So this will become important. The electrostatic per se has not impacted our measurements right now, but as you make them smaller and smaller, they will become important. Okay, so um, so these things can be used, for example, to uh, probe. A simple thing we could do is uh, what's inside a cell. What proteins are present inside the cell? Right. That's 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 one application you can think of. Right. What kind of proteins do I have? Why do you want to do that? Because you know, uh, the kinds of proteins you have in your system, in your body, uh, determines, you know, uh, what kind of diseases you'll get, you know, when will you get it, all those kinds of things. So if you could uh, uh, do these measurements, you could figure out what kind of proteins you have, um, then that would be really nice, right? So to do that, I mean, the, you can ask a very simple question, right? And what we do is we try to ask simple questions whether the answer is simple or not i don't know but we ask you know, how small of a mass can i measure what what is the best that we can do okay that's a question because you want to do these mass measurements the next thing you ask is how small of a mass can i measure can i measure uh, you know uh, uh, less than the hydrogen atom that i showed you right what kind of precision can I get? So <clears throat> here I've showed you the equation, right? I've already told you this, the smallest mass I can measure depends on this part and this part. This is the mass of the device and this is the frequency fluctuation, like right? environmental noise or whatever. So mm, the simplest thing you would say is, look, make the device small and make this frequency fluctuation small. Now that's the obvious answer, right? just based on this simple equation. Okay, um, we can do that. So if you want to make it small, the question is how small can you make it, right? 
I would say, how about atomically thin graphene? That's great, we can do that. But when you make this, there are all kinds of questions that pop up. One is, how do I measure? I, I think it's related to one of the questions someone asked, do things change when you make uh, devices smaller? How do I measure this? Right? These are atomically thin devices. Right? The motion of these devices is going to be even smaller. How do I make that small a change in displacement? How do I measure that small a change in displacement? Right? So, that's a simple, again, a, a simple thing that you need to do, it kind of opens up a Pandora's box, right? I mean, it's like you, it's like an onion, you peel off one layer, you know, new things come up, new questions come up, new challenges come up, right? And it sometimes brings tears to your eyes, similar to onion. But this is what we do. How do I make more precise measurement? Right? One way of doing this would be you send a current through this device. You send a current through this device. And as the device moves up and down, the current changes. Okay? The larger the motion, more the change in current. So that's one way of doing the measurement. Okay, again, you can ask how precisely can you do this measurement? Can you measure uh, 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 10 raised to minus 12 meters, minus 13, minus 14? How precisely can you do this? Because that's going to determine this part. Okay, you can do it with uh, optical systems. Here, the way it works is you have light flowing in this ring. Okay, and this is the mechanical structure that's going to vibrate. As this moves up and down, the light flowing through this ring sees a change in refractive index. Okay, and then you can measure the motion of this device. Again, the question is, what's the minimum displacement I can measure with these devices? All right. Um, the other question, there are other questions in related to uh, uh, measuring biomolecules itself. Will these biomolecules stick? Right? As we make devices smaller and smaller, right? Uh, you know, it's not as if you are sitting here and putting the biomolecule onto the device. What you will be doing is you have a device here, you are going to throw your biomolecules from far away. Now imagine having to throw the biomolecules from far away and making it stick on to a device that's only 100 nanometers wide. Now that's not easy. Okay. The other thing is, look, as you make devices smaller, the size of the device itself will be similar to biomolecule size. Right? If the biomolecule does come and stick to the device, is it now a graphene device? made of carbon atoms or is it a biomolecule device to which carbon you know graphene is stuck which one is it all right so all of these questions come up in terms of frequency fluctuation sure i can make this smaller what does it mean what does this frequency fluctuation mean that just means how much is the frequency fluctuating right and that's going to determine what I can measure. In this particular case, the noise is very small, so I can detect this change. If the noise is large, I will not be able to detect. Okay, so we want to make that small. And the question then comes is, how do I make this small? For that, you need to know where does it come from? Where does the noise come from? Now, that's something that we are trying to figure out in a lot of these devices. Okay, where does the frequency fluctuation come from? Okay, whether this fluctuation will depend on the kind of devices we make, the size of the devices we make. For example, if we make devices smaller, will the frequency fluctuation increase? Right, you're making devices more sensitive. It's also sensitive to noise. What do you do with that? Okay, 
you do all of this, what is the ultimate limit? How small of a frequency fluctuation can you do? You know, how small can you make it? Right? Ultimately, it might be limited by quantum mechanics. How precise of a measurement can I do? Those are some of the questions we try to deal with. Okay, it's It might be ultimately limited to mass sensing, but there are also fundamental aspects to the kinds of measurement we do, to the kinds of questions we ask. Okay. Um, then there are other things. Um, so not just, yes. Uh, so if you can just hold on to the previous slide. Yeah. Uh, Murugappan has a question yeah. about the impact of or the effect of the position of the molecule uh, as to where it comes and adsorbs on the length of the cantilever. How much of an effect does that have on your ability to detect as to what the mass is? Right. Um, very good question. Uh, that's something that uh, is extremely important. Right. So, <clears throat> if the biomolecule comes and hits the center, which is right here, right? This is the entire vibrating structure. If it hits the center, it will produce a maximum change in frequency. Okay, the maximum possible. If it hits at this point, if the biomolecule comes and hits here, it will not produce any change in frequency. Okay, and that's precisely the reason you see for the same protein, this is for a single type of protein, you see different frequency shifts. This one is bigger, this one is smaller. And the reason it is, is that in this particular case, for the bigger jump, the protein landed right in the center. And for the smaller jumps, it probably landed somewhere here. Okay. Now, then the question is, look, if you do not know where it landed, how are you able to make this connection between the frequency shift and the mass? Right, because this itself depends on the position, right? So the problem that you have at hand is this. You have a single equation, which is this equation. You want to find out this, right? This is what you want to find out. But you have two unknowns. One is the frequency. Sorry, uh, <clears throat> you have two unknowns. One is this. The other is the position. Two unknowns and just a single equation. Right? That's a problem that you cannot solve. Okay. So the way to uh, uh, you know solve this problem is to detect two modes of the same device. You look at the fundamental mode and you look at the next harmonic. Okay. Now you have two equations. One for the first mode, one for the second mode. Okay, you have two frequency shifts. One for the first mode, one for the second mode. Okay, so you have two equations and two unknowns. That you can solve. So then what you can do is you can figure out what is the mass of the protein or the biomolecule that landed on your device. What is the position at which it landed? Okay. Interestingly, people have gone even further. Okay, you can ask, look, what happens if the protein is a really long protein, right? For example, it's not a single point, it's really long. So you can do those kinds of measurements also. What you need to do then is measure more and more modes of your device. And then you should be able to do these things. Okay. Very interesting question. And people have done this and experimentally shown this and it works. Aniruddha has a question, but I'm guessing you should give it to him as homework as to how we understand if it's a single molecule or multiple molecules that are resting on the cantilever. Okay. Should I answer it or? <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. I will answer it. Um, okay. The, again, it's a, a interesting experimental question okay it's quite possible that two molecules landed at the same time okay in this particular case now how do you avoid doing that so what you do is uh, while spraying the protein 
you reduce the concentration such that it's extremely unlikely that two protein molecules will hit the device at the same time. Okay, that's the experimental way of doing things. Okay. So I'll just move on then. Okay, so besides sensing, I, I, I like, we like doing, uh, uh, looking at nonlinear dynamics also, like how do these things uh, behave in terms of when there are multiple devices working together, right? I'll just give you, uh, uh, show a video of, uh, maybe you've seen this. Um, so these are fireflies, okay? And some of these fireflies, they flash together. You see that? Right? So these are, uh, you know, uh, lots of entities, um, biological entities, they're you know, flashing together. They start out randomly, right? And then ultimately figure out how to flash together. And you see these kinds of things in a lot of different areas. Um, the other that you might have been part of is when you start clapping or applauding, right? It starts out typically as a random, randomly, right? And then ultimately everyone starts clapping at the same time. Now that's a collective response. So what we want to do is try and see if we can get that kind of response with our devices, a collective response of multiple devices with our device, uh, multiple devices. For example, in this case, we have made lots of these devices, right? These, a lot of these, these are devices made of uh, MOS2. We work with Vasu on this, uh, uh, on this project. These are all individual devices about a micron long, okay? So the question that you can ask is, look, is it possible to kind of mimic what biological entities are doing, right? There, there are, you know, these fireflies that are flashing. Is it possible for us to make sure that this device moves in synchrony with this device? Is it possible for all of these devices, all of these uh, 25, 30 devices, for them to move together? Right, that's a question. And, and not just from understanding it from fundamental point of view, but it has lots of applications, right? Timing is where you need this synchronization of clocks. Now, if you can show these things, that would be really nice. And the advantage of these kinds of devices, as opposed to studying, say, biological entities, is that in these devices, I can tune a lot of things. I can tune how close these two are to each other, right? If they are close to each other, then the synchrony might happen much more quickly, right? If they are far apart from each other, synchrony might not happen, right? Those are things, the coupling between the two entities, three entities, that will determine the collective response. And with these devices that we fabricate, we have that control. Right? So there are also other questions like, for example, how do how does energy uh, move from one entity to the other? Right? How will it move? Right? We talked about uh, multiple modes a couple of uh, minutes ago, right? Is it possible that the energy flows from one mode, this is the fundamental mode, this one, to the first mode? Uh, second mode. Can we move it from one mode to the other? Is it possible? What effect does it have on the performance of the device? Right? So we are interested in those kinds of questions. Okay? Um, that's all I have. Uh, I didn't want to include too many slides. Uh, but if you have questions, I'm happy to answer. This is uh, the photograph of 
uh, our center. This is the center that we have. Uh, we have a really fantastic clean room. These are some of the uh, staff members who man the clean room. This is the aerial shot of our center um, and some of the devices and characterization that we do here. So thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. I think, Akshay, we had uh, quite a few questions uh, along the way. Mm -hmm. uh, if uh, the audience has any more questions, this is last call, as they say, to uh, ask Professor Akshay and I, at least for today. Okay, I don't see any uh, posts there. So thank you for joining us on this first episode of Why Sense, the Center for Nanoscience and Engineering. And I hope you enjoyed Akshay talking about how he uses extremely delicate structures to measure very small things, all the way down to a single hydrogen atom or masses even smaller than that of a single hydrogen atom. And as to how he is going to go on and probably be studying quantum effects using these structures uh, in the days ahead. So if you're interested in this research, if you would like to work with him, just send us an email and uh, we will respond to you. All right. Thank you for joining us once again and stay tuned for the next episode of Ysense that will come up in a week or two from now. Thank you and bye. Thank you. Bye.